first, I want to start by saying thank you to all of the, the staff and the volunteers that make this integration symposium happen, uh, you know, especially this year, putting it all online. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, a big thank you to Dr. Strawn, Dr. Bjork for their thoughts on this response. And, you know, I also want to say thank you to Eric and Olivia, Rachel, Matthew and Hannah for being my sounding board as I've kind of bounced some ideas off. I want to thank Dr. Sean Love for his thoughtful response beforehand. And mostly, I want to thank you, Dr. Tan. Um, Dr. Tan, you have been an inspiration to many and continue to do that work in integration. So in this response, I would like to do two things. First, I want to reaffirm the five assumptions that Dr. Tan discussed. Second, I would like to add one more to that list. I think a fundamental aspect of human nature is our capacity for relationships. What it means to be made in the image of God, at least in part, is our relationality. I believe deeply that an important aspect of biblical anthropology is relationality. So in an effort to embody that, um, allow me to provide a little bit of context about myself. I come from a small agricultural town located on the border of Illinois. I grew up as a pastor's kid and a son to a mother who was a nurse and herself suffered from a chronic illness. I identified as pretty much whatever denomination my father was employed by, which primarily was Southern Baptist. And then <clears throat> after a shoulder surgery derailed my dreams of kind of continuing college baseball, I came to California and I made my way to Talbot School of Theology. During my time at Talbot, I fell in love with Anglicanism and was confirmed in 2018. My studies in pastoral care and counseling kind of led me in this direction to understand the psychological side of care. And so I came up to Fuller to pursue my PsyD. As my views continue to grow and change, I have come to resonate deeply with the work of Dr. Warren Brown and Dr. Brad Strawn on human nature. With all that said, Let's jump in and discuss Dr. Tan's five assumptions about human nature. My comments are intended to ground Dr. Tan's assumptions more deeply in a relational anthropology that is embedded, affective, and communal. So number one, Dr. Tan stated that basic psychological and spiritual needs include the needs for security or love, significance, like having meaning and impact, and hope or also forgiveness. I would add that without relationships, these basic needs cannot be met. Research shows that even higher primates need more than just food and shelter to survive. They need relationships. Further, human attachment theories suggest that we are no different. We need those relationships to survive. The God we read about in the Bible makes relational moves over and over. Dr. Irvin Yalom might describe what God does as remaining experience close. God seeks us out. God doesn't shy away from us. The Trinitarian God knows full well of our neediness, that security and love. God knows of all of our dreams of a promised land, of the, the meaning and the hope in life. And God knows our penchant towards betrayal and the subsequent need for forgiveness. By committing to us in this way, God gives us a relational model and he also fulfills it. Following God's model, as we embody relationality in our pastoral and psychological counseling, even as we embody it in our day-to-day -day relationships, we make both ourselves and those around us more human by filling these mutual needs. Number two, Dr. Tan proposes that humans' basic problem is sin, but personal sin or the sins of others is not the cause of all emotional suffering. I think sin can be a pretty complicated word for psychology, and it's often shied away from for the fear of being too reductionistic. Due to the realities of genetic and hereditary illness, we know that the things that some people suffer from are, are just simply not their fault. What I wanna focus on though is how all of us are embedded in relationships. Sin, if we think about it on like a cosmic scale, is the cause of this breakdown of relationships and then the suffering that follows. We see it in the lives of our clients, our parishioners, and our loved ones. We feel that breakdown in the fabric of our deeply interconnected world. I mean, just look at this last year, for example. The social, the social disconnect, among other things, has been really tough for me. 
And uh, I imagine I'm not the only one. For some of these things, the scars will never really go away once those wounds have healed. But the people that stand alongside me in the hardship remind me that no matter what, this life is meant to be lived together. Number three, Dr. Tan said, the ultimate goal of humanity is to know God and have spiritual health. So from a relational perspective, I would suggest that this only happens in relationship. As God, the Holy Spirit dwells in and among us, we cannot discount the many ways that we get to know God through our relationships with others, the world and scripture. I was fortunate enough to take a course with a wonderful professor here at Fuller named Dr. Richard Peace. In his book, Noticing God, Dr. Peace says that the end result of living in communities that are intended to increase the likelihood that we will notice God is an increased likelihood that we will bear spiritual fruit and utilize spiritual gifts. It will also be a challenge to grow and love one another. We can start by learning how to see Christ in others. What I believe he demonstrates in this quote is the way that God has made us relational creatures. And when we view life from this angle, coming to know God is an inevitable process. I believe that as we come to recognize God's image in each other, we too learn a great deal about the God who is of no nationality or race or gender or language, yet at the same time created all of this diversity. Thus, I would propose expanding Dr. Tan's idea and suggest that a primary way to know God and have spiritual health is to be in relationship with one another. Number four, in line with cognitive behavioral therapeutic approaches, Dr. Tan suggests that problem feelings are usually due to problem behaviors and more fundamentally to problem thinking. I would like to add that we come to know how to feel, behave, and think in large part from how we make sense of our relational environment and how that environment impacts us. Consider how there are systems today that can still be oppressive, muting the voices of minorities and people of color and influencing their beliefs about themselves and their value. The relational environments around us shape our thinking, our feeling, and our behavior. I think the theory of extended cognition has a lot to offer us in this respect. The basic premise of the theory is that what we would traditionally think of as our mind is not just located in our brain or our body, but instead it's embedded in our interactions with the world around us. So my thinking and feeling and behaving is not simply bound up in my own mind or brain, but it, it kind of spills out over into the space between. In other words, even the mind functions in a relational context. Thus, as therapists, friends, parents, spouses, we can believe that our role with others is, is not only to offer a new way of thinking or uncovering a new insight. Rather, by being in relationship, we become an integral and even intermingled part of the healing process that God is doing. Number five. Dr. Tan notes that he holds a holistic view of persons with physical, mental, emotional, social, and spiritual dimensions. I also affirm this and agree that these different dimensions are similar to different viewing angles when we're observing kind of the same object. It is in this viewing of a whole person from these diverse vantage points that our relationality comes to its fullness. Our conscious awareness of these varied but simultaneously embodied states that are concomitant influences and in our interactions with other people and other things is precisely what makes life distinctly human. A life that is soaked with God's holy relational presence beyond our comprehension. With this in mind, as we interact with others, may we be ready and willing to relationally experience them. Following the example of our God who took on flesh and cared deeply for whole persons, not just their mental life or their souls. I want to close with the thought that has long compelled me about these stories I read in scripture. What makes the biblical narrative so provocative, at least in my opinion, is Emmanuel. God comes to us. 
God makes that relational move. And in American culture, where loneliness and feelings like I don't belong are rampant, I think the church can offer a place of belonging to others in relationship. To be like Jesus means we don't run from the messiness of life. We don't run from the scars and the gaping wounds that prompt people to seek our professional help. But instead, like Jesus, we press in close. We touch the festering wounds of the lepers. We challenge unjust oppression. We seek out good for those who are less fortunate. And we need to be ready for God to work at times and even in ways we never expect or prefer. I hope what I have offered is a relational paradigm to couch Dr. Tan's five views of human nature in. And even more, I hope I have made clear how important you are and the ways that you uniquely show up for others. Therefore, as you look at your clients, your parishioners, your partners, your loved ones, friends, and dare I even say enemies, may you see that they are both created and being created by what the late Fuller professor, Dr. Ray Anderson, might have called a relational Imago Dei. Human nature is such an exciting area of study for me. So it is with great honor and humility that I again express my appreciation for Dr. Tan and his lecture, and even more for his support and his encouragement along my journey here at Fuller. And to you for listening to what I've had to offer. Thank you. Peace be with you.